man. I'm finna do music. I said, you finna do what? He said, I finna do music. I said, what you know about some music? And he said, oh, I'm gonna do this with Dre and, you know, make this, this group and make this music. And he gave me like uh, a couple of ounces of crack. And he said, man, I'm out, man. You, I ain't doing this no more. Well, I took it and I said, good luck, buddy. I'm gone. I kept doing it. So being affiliated in the dope game, of course he knew people from everywhere because he dealt with all type of people from all over. You know what I mean? And that was basically his, his street affiliation. You know what I'm saying? So he was a real cat from the street, no doubt. You know what I'm saying? People who know, know. Mind you, this is like 89, although Eric has started his label in like 86, 87. He really didn't focus on acts that he signed. He was more focused on putting out the Easy Does It record and the NWA Straight Out of Compton record. And when that blew up, now you know his label was established, and now he's ready to, you know, put out other artists. And uh, he told me they was tripping and they threatened him, uh, and I couldn't believe that, you know. But it wasn't Dre, you know. So I couldn't believe, you know, like, nah, not Dre, like, nah, Suge and his people and all of that. Basically telling, because Suge actually came up to Easy and put his arm around him, and then they walked off, and Suge was like basically trying to threaten him a little bit. So me and my brother walked over there, and Michael Conception seen us talking, Snoop mobbed up. And so Michael Conception was like, man, this ain't the time and place for that. So well, actually, when we went outside, we thought they was gonna try something, so we sent one of our homeboys back to back over here to watch, and he brought like seven guns. You know what I'm saying? Brought the guns back. We all got a pistol. We stepped outside and we we pushed up on Suge and him like, "What y'all want to do? We thought y'all wanted to do something." You know what I'm saying? City G's, a real motherfucking G's. We didn't want to present Compton as a gangster town because it's not. It's a there's beautiful homes and neighborhoods there, and uh, that's why. Uh, brought in the helicopter and and did the aerials of Compton and showing these beautiful neighborhoods and, and that life's awesome it's beautiful there and and uh, I wanted to present Compton in in a very good light you know he was just ahead of his time but I mean that's what the Rebus radio show was really about unfortunately we started in July July 4th weekend of 1994 and he passed away in March of 1995 so we didn't really get to Get it off, and then he was sick for the last three months of it, so he didn't. He only really caught like five, six months. months. So at that time, they made it official. He was in the hospital. Now, remind me that at this time he was uh, very sick, and from what we gathered, he was signing a lot of paperwork. The paperwork that he was signing is not, not it's not a secret. Uh, he was signing different documents pertaining to the run of the company. That's why I talked to Toka. We, you know, we used to go down to Mexico with him. And uh, he was saying, uh, he spoke to him and said, uh, get him out of here. He didn't want to be in the hospital. Because remember, I think they were the only ones that really got, did you get to see him when he was in the world? Yeah. I think they, they were the only ones that got to see him before they moved him to that last room. Because remember, they moved him twice. They moved him like in the middle. What the fuck is that about? Yeah. Man, come on, what is that? That makes no damn sense. You hiding, you hiding somebody in the hospital from who is fans, motherfuckers that love me. You know what I'm saying? We was all on one floor. The fools was in the hallway crying and everything, and he wasn't even on that floor no more. Yeah, that was gangster. Uh, and he was a visionary. He was a great visionary. And I just think it's so tragic that he would be taken from us. On March 26th of 1995, and I myself have never been satisfied with the facts surrounding his his uh, his death. There's a lot more things that went on. The reason why we have the industry that we have, you know, in a whole, is because of Easy E. It's part of. He's a part of that. You know, I, I witnessed that. I lived that. You know, and I want people to know that the industry period, not just gangster rap, just period, urban music as it is today, he's a part of that. You know, give him his credit, give him his props. Don't look over him and give other people props before you give it to that man. This is the story of Easy e 
godfather of gangster rap. This is a story to give us a better perspective on his life, his personality, how he was on a day-to-day -day basis, how he interacted with his business associates, with his artists, and with his family and friends. I'm, I'm a big Easy e fan, one of the biggest Easy e fans you can possibly imagine. And this is what I want to, to hear, to see, to learn about. And by creating this film, I have learned a lot into his personality, his life, his lifestyle. And it's a lot of interesting stuff. And I know you are, you're all going to love it. You know, rest in peace, Easy e This is for you. Your memory and legacy lives, lives on forever. My name is Sergio. I am the owner creator of EasyCPT.com, RuthlessFamily.com, and a few other uh, Easy Ruthless related websites. This documentary is something that I've always wanted to put together. Something to give um, all the fans out there, including myself. Uh, a, a closer look into the life and legacy of Easy. I'm a big fan. I know there's so many fans out there. And I know that we all share a very similar story. We all share the story where we first heard of Easy and we were immediately hooked. And I hear that story told many, many times by other fans. Welcome to Ruthless Memories documentary about the life and legacy of Easy E. But I'm the big A, originally OG Compton, uh, born and raised with Eric Wright, Easy E, AK, as everybody knowing. And, uh, I'm part of that beginning of the blueprint. I knew uh, Eric before he was Easy E. Um, Eric was uh, a good friend of mine. Um, we did a lot of things together prior to the music business and prior to the streets, you know what I mean? Um, Eric was a real quiet, shy guy, uh, as, as you know. Basically, everybody knew Eric was a real quiet, shy, but he had a lot of street business sense. And that's what critiqued him and made him so different from the world of a lot of other people in the game. You know what I mean? There were a lot of people in the game that he associated with um, that did, you know, that knew the artistic abilities but didn't have the business six. And since he was a futurist, he had that business sense. But uh, I knew Eric before he was easy to eat. I knew Eric when he used to turn back flips over the uh, fences. And I knew Eric when he used to get lighter fluid and uh, make the gopher come out the hole and he'll light the lighter fluid when the gopher head stuff so the gopher would run around the backyard on fire. He would get off on that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? He was very athletic, he turned back, flipped summer sauces, Arabians, he was just a very athletic type of guy, and very smart, but he did have a vision to succeed, you know, whether it was uh, been in the streets hustling or was it, you know, on his own company doing whatever. But, you know, he had a low rider, he wanted to have the best low rider. You know what I mean? When he, uh, I remember days where he was my little homeboy. And we was, back in the days we would do burglaries. You know, we would go to Long Beach and do burglaries. And I wouldn't allow E to come in the house. We just juice his car. You know what I mean? And we would have all the merchandise in the car. And he would see color TVs and the VCRs. He's like, man, let me buy it for my mom. I'm like, no, Eric, you don't give moms, you know. Stolen goods, we sell this and with the money you buy something brand new. You know what I mean? So like I said, we, we, we went way back then. Eric we always observed. And because he didn't use drugs and smoke or drink in his early part of his life, that you know, that kept him above the rest. You know, because all of us, we were a little bit older than Eric. It's a little bit, not that much. But you know, we was always, you know, smoking weed, you know what I mean? Drinking forties. And uh, he didn't like the way beer tastes, nor did he like the way the weed smelled. So, you know, 
you know. That's why he became successful into the street business that he created, that he's a part of, you know what I mean? He made a lot of money hustling. Easy was a, uh, he chose his friends. See, he chose his friends. He chose the people he hang, chose to hang around with, you know what I mean? You had to really know Eric to go to his, to his house, knock on the door, ask him to come outside. You know, Eric was the early bird. He'd get up real early. I had a homeboy, Greg Tucker. Eric rapped about him in a couple of songs, you know what I mean? Um, but Eric admired Greg because Greg was, you know, he was good at stealing cars. He would always have cars. So Eric would actually get up early in the morning and wait on uh, Greg's porch, which was next door to me. So we lived around the corner from each other. We lived on one street. I lived right over the street, the next street over. And uh, we was all Greenleaf. Uh, and he would wait on Greg to get up, man. You know, that's how, how Eric was, you know what I mean? <laughs> He would wait up early in the morning, wait for Greg to get up, get us all up, and we would go do what we do, whether it's just hang out the house and, you know, get into mischiefs, or somebody had stole a car, we go joyriding and stuff like that. And Eric started, you know, uh, I think he got a little job or something. He got him a little money in his pocket, and, you know, started a little side hustle. Bought his first car, which was a 72, I think 72, 73 glass house for priest. No room with a white vinyl top. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. MC Ren, revolutionary. <laughs> nah, MC Ren, you know. But I am a revolutionary, though. For sure. You know. So when I was young in the streets, ain't the same way it is now. You know, motherfuckers getting caught up, and, you know. But it was a lot of fun, too, you know. Everybody always talk about the bad parts. But shit, that shit was fun, too. You know what I'm saying? But it was, like, the same as it is now. You know, everybody's still doing their thing, man. It was hard back then, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, wasn't really, uh, it wasn't that, it wasn't a lot of people, man, really talking about Compton, Watts, LA, Long Beach, all of that. You know what I'm saying? They thought it was just all palm trees and sunshine. And once we came out, everybody started looking at it. I mean, a big man. Uh, I was easy security, and I uh, considered him one of my best friends. When I first met he, well, it was way back in the day. Me and his cousin, Big Horse, was friends, and he was his, you know, his little cousin. And uh, Big Horse was, uh, he moved a little weight in the neighborhood, and. Uh, he was this little little runner, and when uh, Horace passed, somebody killed him, and pretty much he inherited the business, and we just hit it off from there, doing what we had to do in the streets. Oh, he, he was man. He he's just like ruthless. He it was about his money, about making money, marketing, doing everything. I remember. When he first, he got the uh, some stuff from Horace had hid, and he called me over to his house, and he said, uh, I said, what are you going to do, man? He said, well, I'm going to rock this stuff up. I'm going to sell it. I said, okay. And he had some big old boulders. I said, what is that, dude? And he said, oh, just like 50. I just grabbed the whole bag. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> You can give me that for 50. Don't give nobody else that. And I showed him how to cut it down because he, he only knew wholesale stuff. He didn't know how to do it on the street level. He would have been giving away too much. So I said, no, man, break it like this. That's what you give to people. That's what you give to people. And we hit it off from there, man. I mean, every time I needed something, I just went to eat. Crack at first hit i mean no one knew what it was i used to make run for older cats run powder i didn't even know what it was i didn't know how to rock up no dope. i just knew you pick people put up their nose that's what they do and somebody uh showed me they said man look what they do. you can do with this you can make this and i'm like oh okay and from there on it's like new jack city when g money went to nino and said this is new stuff what new stuff? I mean, showed me how to do it. 
it took off. So we were pretty much the first on the block because, like he used to say in the songs, you know, the cops, they didn't know, you know. I remember the first few times I got caught with big wads of crack in my pockets. The cops would hit you on the hand and say, don't do it no more. You get a DA reject. You never went to jail. You went to jail, but the court never came around. So at the first, they didn't know the city. They didn't know what, what was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen. All we knew people were doing anything for it and spending and getting money any way they can to buy it. So we said, well, hell, keep selling it. And we made a good share of money. It was a, a nice, I know I made a nice chunk, so I had to just imagine the chunk he made. I made a nice chunk. Necessarily didn't, you know, per se gang bang. He was just like, you know, you didn't have to gang bang to be affiliated with as a gang member. You know what I mean? Uh, if you notice, he always claimed, you know, Southeast Compton. You know what I'm saying? Because his relationships and friendships were on both sides. So his affiliation was like, you know, if I get along with these dudes and I'm part of these dudes, I'm from Compton. Because, you know, a lot of people don't understand. Back in our days, there wasn't such thing as the different sets at Brooklyn and Compton. You know, Santana Block of Nine Drive, Kelly Park, Neighborhood, Southside. You know what I mean? It wasn't really broke up. It was all CC Riders, Compton Crips. You know what I mean? Back in the days, there wasn't such thing as, you know, all the different sets that broken up into Compton now. You know, if you was an OG, you know, just CC, Compton Crip. You know what I mean? So basically, you know, Eric's affiliation was Compton Crips. So that's why he was able to claim. Southeast Compton. But his affiliation with his hood was between N Hood and Kelly Park and Lang Drive. We all lived in those three sections. Yeah, and, and back in those days, uh, just living in the neighborhood, you was affiliated with the, the gang. That's just how it was. And uh, I never knew E to claim a neighborhood like that. He would flow all over the place. He had business places for people. Everybody knew him, but he had the backings of a lot of the gangs. He was just a hustler, man. You know, you know how it is. You grow up in the hood. You don't have to be gang banging, but you got homies that gang bang, or you just affiliated or whatever. He wasn't. No. He was just about paper. You know what I'm saying? About paper. You know, he was cool. He ain't never done nothing to nobody funny. You know, he ain't have loose lips. You know how to, you know, keep stuff to yourself. You know, you don't be tattletelling and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I don't, I know he, I, he claimed in hood, but I never heard him myself just yelling it out, throwing up some signs. That's just, when not how he rolled. But he, he was down for, for what he had to be down for. BG Knockout. Most people remember the real Compton City G's with the Easy. Rest in peace. So, Easy grew up in Compton. You know what I mean? Uh, he grew up actually in Kelly Park. Uh, he was affiliated. He was actually affiliated with Kelly Park, but the whole side of Compton where he grew up at was the neighborhood cribs, the Kelly Park cribs, and the South Side cribs. So he was actually affiliated kind of with all those people in that area. And uh, easy thing was, easy always been about money. You know what I'm saying? He was never really a gang member when he went and did drive-bys and rode on different sets for, you know, for the hood that he grew up in where he was from. But, you know, he was affiliated over there. Easy got into the dope gang real early, you know. I mean, he used to do his thing, man. He, he used to do his thing. And, uh, you know, everybody know where we come from, or where we grew up at, what he was doing. But he turned it, you know, took that money started his company and did all of that, man. You know, he was out there big. When I was like 13, 12, 13, 14, like that, he was doing his thing with that. You know what I'm saying? He always had the tightest shit, tightest cars, money, jewelry, all that bullshit. So he was doing his thing, man. And one day he just said, I'm gonna do this record thing. Because back in the day, even when he was balling, you know, before he really got real big doing the street thing, he had a, uh, him and Dre had a, uh, like a DJ crew, you know what I'm saying? And they would go around for high power productions. 
they would do like house parties, you know, in the neighborhood. They would get paid to do shit up in other neighborhoods and cities. So he was always into music and shit like that. Like as far as trying to do the house party shit. But when uh, Dre blew up with the wrecking crew, and he got back in contact with Dre, just, you know, just blew up. And I never forget, I one day I came over his house to pick up something. And he said, I remember Dre, I think Dre was there. And I, at that point, you know, I'd never met none of the cats. I knew Ren just from seeing him around. But Q, Dre, Yella, I didn't know none of them cats. And I came over there one day and he had bought a, a big, like a DJ booth thing, mixing boards and turntables. And he said, uh, he said, man, I'm finna do music. I said, you finna do what? He said, I'm finna do music. I said, what you know about some music? And he said, well, I'm gonna do this with Dre and, you know, make this, this group and make this music. And I'm like, when I first met Dre, I saw him, I was like, he had, you know, Dre used to wear two earrings. I said, dude, he gay? <laughs> No, I, you know, I didn't know no better. I'm like, two earrings, bro. <laughs> what was up with this dude? He said, ah, oh, man, Trey, cool. He cool, man, this and that. And he gave me, like, uh, a couple of ounces of crack. And he said, man, I'm out, man. You, I ain't doing this no more. I said, well, I took it, and I said, good luck, buddy. I'm gone. I kept doing it. And uh, I kind of lost touch with him. Anybody out there who don't know, I'm Yomo from Yomo and Marquis. Well, I tell you what, uh, O'Shea Jackson, if y'all don't know, that's Ice Cube. We went to high school together, and uh, we was really the only ones rapping in school and really in, in the city. It was it was me, uh, Q, King T, Ice T, and that was basically it. We, we was pretty, pretty much the only ones rapping in the city, whereas at that time, in LA, it was more about like dance music and dancing. I don't know if y'all uh, remember, but Uncle Jam's Army, big DJ crew, he used to rent out the Coliseum, and I mean not not the Coliseum, but the uh, sports arena and the convention center downtown, and throw these big parties, you know, dance parties, and and you know, Dre was with them. He was with the world class wrecking crew, all that, right? So Q called me at the crib one day. Now, mind you, we in high school. He tells me that uh, this cat named Easy E out of Compton got about five hundred thousand dollars that he wants to start a record label. And you know, would I be down? And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. You know, because at that time it was no record labels. Hip hop was all East Coast, Def Jam, and you know things like that. And that's how I met Eric. I remember him telling us about Alonzo. Alonzo was real big back in the days, you know what I mean? Um, you know, Egyptian lover days and all that stuff. And Alonzo was behind all that movement, so he would always, you know, want to meet someone that was in that business, you know, that could take it to the next level. He had his ideas of what he wanted to do, but, you know, you have to meet people and come from the street and wasn't easy meeting those people in the, in the record label executives. I remember mean, McCullough, that was big back in the days. You couldn't just go to McCullough, you had to know somebody in there. So Alonzo was his contact. So, you know, up to this day, you know, a lot of people heard about it, know about it, but, you know, Eric paid Alonzo, you know, some money to meet with Jerry, but Alonzo, you know, Jerry really didn't have time for all that, you know, but finally he did get that meeting with, uh, with Jerry, through Alonzo, and uh, once they hooked up, you know, knowing Jerry Heller, as much as he was in the gang, he was a futurist too, plus he was an incubator, you know what I mean? And he's seen that vision, you know, about being in the music business. He's seen something different, so that's what kind of piqued Eric's interest. Well, Easy and I were going to law school together at Harvard, <laughs> and uh, I was uh, managing some groups over at uh, Macola, which was a pressing plant in Hollywood. <laughs> Egyptian lover, 
Rodney Owen, Joe Cooley, World Class Wrecking Crew, LA Dream Team, JJ Fab, and also over there pressing were uh, Jay King with the Timex Social Club, and MC Hammer, and Bobby Jimmy and the Critters, and that was the place. A little pressing plan over on Santa Monica and nearby. So I was managing the wrecking crew and Alonzo kept telling me about this dude that wanted to meet me named Easy, named Eric Wright. Okay? I didn't know his name was Easy either. And finally, after about two months of bugging me, I agreed to meet with him because he had promised Alonzo $750 to introduce, to introduce us. So he got out of this Suzuki Samurai with MC Ram, reached down in his sock and pulled out a roll and paid Alonzo the 750, and uh, uh, I was impressed with his, he was very charismatic. I mean, he was a little guy, but he was clean, and there's just something clean about him. You know, cool, clean. And uh, I said to him, you got anything you want to play for me? Because I was given sort of rushing him, you know? I mean, for 750, you don't get a lot of time. So, uh, all he said to me was, yeah. Now, see, that spoke volumes in itself. Because in the music business, it's all about bullshit, man. I got this guy, and I got this girl, and I got this group, and this is my boy, and this is my guy, and this is my group. It's all bullshit, man. They got nothing. You know, it's just hype. So, uh, all he said was, yeah. So he was willing to let his music do the talking, you know? And sometimes less is more, and it certainly was in that case, because he played me Boys in the Hood. And the minute I heard it, I said to myself, this is it, this is what I've been looking for, you know? This is the most important music I've heard since rock and roll started in the early 60s, mid 60s, because well, that's where I was. Bill Graham and David Geffen and Irving Azoff and Albert Grossman and that's where I was there. So uh, it, to me it was sort of a combination of Gil Scott Heron and the Rolling Stones with the intensity and vision of the Black Panthers. So I loved the honesty of it and I loved the impact. And I said, oh, play for me again. And so he played it for me a couple of times. He played me another song. And uh, I said, what do you want? He said, uh, I want to be 50-50 partners. So I said, you know, it's going to be better if this is a black-owned company. Because your idol is Barry Gordy. And I'm going to make you Barry Gordy. I said, and you're going to change the stereotypes of Little Richard and Bo Diddley and Jackie Wilson and all those early great rock and roll artists that were uh, more or less uh, uh, taken advantage of by white mob guys in, in the music business. They wound up with no publishing and no money. And, and uh, I said, that's never going to happen. You know, we're going we're gonna to make it so that Everybody shares in the wealth because the music business is a win-win business. And the more the artist makes, the more everybody makes. So in that respect, in any other business, in a real estate deal, the more you make, the less somebody else makes. That's not true in the music business. It's exactly the opposite. But the funny part of it is everybody we're involved with got rich, and they still talk shit about us anyhow. So, you know, it's... But we felt good about what we did. And he could certainly be proud of his legacy. See, you know, they, they told me it was going to be called Rock House Records. Because that was the term for, you know, a dope house or a crack house. We used to call it Rock Houses. Uh, and we sitting in a studio. Now, this is at Lonzo's World Class Studio. Lonzo was the leader of the, of the wrecking crew. Uh, you know, Ham, Dre, DJ Unknown, Clientele, and Yella. We sitting in, in, in Lonzo's world-class studios at his house, and, I, you know, I don't know, I, I really wasn't feeling the whole rock house records. 
So I'm looking through the papers. That's 1986. And at the time, the movie Ruthless People was out with Danny DeVito. And I said, you know what? Man, why don't we just call it Ruthless Records? The rest is history. So really, for y'all that don't know, Yomo of Yomo Marquis named Ruthless Records. Only I, only myself and Easy knows that. And now you guys know that. Man, just being young, doing house party, you know, doing that type of stuff, man. And, you know, she stayed around the corner, you know what I'm saying? He set up his label. He knew I could rhyme and hook me up, man. You know, start being with him every day. Signed me to a solo uh, contract, and uh, that didn't work out, you know what I'm saying? So he just pulled me into the group, and ever since then, we just been national. You know, they, you know they, they, uh, Jerry and Easy rented a little office space in a strip mall in the valley, and they was running it out of there, and, and then, you know, things really start to blow up and take off, and they got this nice office space, still in the valley, but in this, in this really nice building. And uh, the atmosphere was... Uh, it was fun, man, you know, because I was, I was young, I was a kid, so, you know, it was money around, and and, and, and we was doing things, and, and, of course, making music, and, you know, going to clubs, and, and VIP this, and VIP that, it, it was, it was uh, really an experience. Uh, my, my name is Julio G. Uh, I go back to the 1580 K-Day days, for people that don't know about radio in Los Angeles, first hip-hop station in L.A., uh, also did 92.3 The Beat, 100.3 The Beat in L.A., 93.5 K-Day in L.A. Um, and also, uh, I knew Eric Wright, Easy E. I met Eric Wright, Easy E, I met him at a, a Bell High School dance. And uh, I was DJing live on the radio. We used to do this thing called Friday Night Live back then and uh, we would play live in different like locations so <clears throat> this certain night we were playing at Bell High School they used to have uh, real popular dances there so uh, we ended up the KD Mix Masters played and I happened to be on the turntables and, and I looked over and I seen a guy standing over there and he looked all sharp like he looked like real like put together like how people know Easy E when he grew up that's how I met him he looked like a star already it was, it was crazy and then I was wondering why he was what he was doing at Bell High School at a Bell High School dance because it wasn't like it was all Latinos there, you know. So it wasn't like you know Compton was a few cities over. So I was wondering like where, where, why he was here. You know what I mean? I noticed him basically, and that's how I first seen Easy E. And then um, a little bit later he came over to me and he asked me what I play Boys in the Hood on the radio. And uh, after a couple of tries he convinced me to do it, and I ended up playing Boys in the Hood like a, maybe like a verse or two of it on the radio for the first time and. Uh, that's how, that's how I met him. That's how we became friends. I do for me playing that, that record for the first time, and then from there on, that's when we built a relationship from there. You know what I mean? So that was my first time meeting Eric Wright. Huh. All right. They call me KJ, Joe Fierro, Easy E's personal bodyguard, NWA's head of security, and Jerry Heller's bodyguard. The way I met Easy, uh, we were in Florida. I was on on tour with the Bus Boys. And Adrian Gravy, which was Easy's manager, was in town with Easy doing some show. And they came over to my room and asked me if I wanted to uh, meet a friend, a client of his. And I said, well, I'm still on tour with Eddie Murphy and the Bus Boys, but uh, yeah, I'll come over and meet him. And we went over to Eric's room and uh, a little short brother, cool looking guy was asking me what I was doing in the future. And I said, well, I'm about to end my tour, but uh, at the moment, nothing at all. Why? And he said, well, I'm starting a group called NWA back in Compton. And uh, we'd like to know if you'd like to come on board. And Jerry Heller speaks highly of you. And uh, one thing led to another. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to leave. And if, he, if I did want to leave now, he could pay me. I said yes. Next thing I know, I was heading to California. I left left Eddie Murphy and the Bus Boys and came to California with Eric. The studio was always fun. I was the studio was just super crazy fun. We get to the studio every weekday. You know what I'm saying? Like twelve, 
on, 12 on to whatever, you know what I'm saying, every big day. You know what I'm saying, it was just us in the studio, me, E, Yella, Dre, you know, uh, Doc. It was a lot, like everybody from the beginning be there, like mostly, you know what I'm saying, and we just have fun, man. You know what I'm saying, just have fun. For all the problems with money and all that type of shit, it was just all fun and unbelievable, you know what I'm saying, to just be doing that shit, and then for the records to blow up so fast, man, it was like, it just put us on another planet, man, we had so much fun in the studio, doing shows, I remember doing shows, when we first started out, we had to drive and shit, we had to drive bands, you know what I'm saying, and we be doing shows, being opening up for New York cats, all up north, like Oakland, uh, Oregon, uh, Washington, all this Phoenix, all shit like that. You know what I'm saying? We open for their ass. And we always used to just roll in bands. It's us. Me, E, Dre, Yella, Speed, uh, Q, and we just roll in the van. So it, we spending all this time stuck on a little ass van, you know, doing shows. You know, you're going to have the little riffs and shit, but because you're so confined with each other for that amount of time, but. It was just fun, man. Just, I think of them, them days in the vans and staying at fucking motels and shit. Not hotels, we was in motels at first and shit, doing shit like that, man. And I was like, all that shit is classic. I wish I had a motherfucking camera and could have taped all of that shit. Just had tapes and tapes and tapes of all of that shit, man. You know what I'm saying? Just so motherfuckers can see, man, like how everybody, Cause everybody see us and they think like back in the day, everybody just, you know, we just stay like tense all day, you know, just real tense. Man, them fools is comedians, man. The whole group is, all of them funny. Everybody's funny, fun times, you know, and it's just, all it is now is memories, man. Code 187, AKA Big Hutch, Brother Laws of Crew, you know, official, ruthless vets. I heard about um, Easy E and it was like the late, you know, um, late '80s, um, and you know I was out there hustling. You know what I'm saying? I'm from Pomona, California. You know, and uh, you know at the time, like street music really wasn't. It hadn't surfaced like far as like you know how it is nowadays, to where like you know it's full blown basically. It was all core underground, just hip hop in general, and. Um, my crew of Ola Law, we was writing kind of like the same type of music at the time, but, you know, from the perspective of a hustler, you know, in the streets, you know, when they're getting grimy, pushing weight type of aspect. And we really felt what N.W.A. was doing, you know what I'm saying? Easy E, the whole conglomerate and everything. Um, and that's basically how I kind of gravitated to what Easy was doing, you know. We had a mutual friend, which was um, Layla, which was... Um, our DJ and our crew at the time, Gomac, which was his brother, and um, he was he worked he wrote songs with N.W.A. and um, worked at Ruthless Records at the time, and we shot him a demo, which was the Living Like Hustlers demo, and um, this was like 1988, early '88, and uh, you no, know, they dug it at the time. They was about to go on tour on uh, Straight Outta Compton, actually Easy Does It tour, and. Uh, they was digging what we was doing. I mean, because we were some grimy street kids from Pomona, kind of doing the same thing that they was doing, but more like on the hustle of grind tip. You know, we kind of got plugged up by some street guys we was messing with and turned a guy that worked with NWA, which was Laylaw. And, you know, so it was history of the law from the beginning, you know. And I think the thing that, the, the beautiful thing at Ruthless Records was like, Easy allowed us to do what we wanted to do. Like, we couldn't have ever, done living like hustlers with MCA or Capital or all these other big companies. We we were able to do living like hustlers and say what the fuck we wanted to say on that record because Easy let us do it, basically. Him being a type of executive was like he looked and it's funny because music of that format was is it wasn't even existing. It's like he created a whole that company created a whole new format for music at the time. You know, there was no gangster rap industry there was no hardcore rap industry for us everything in rap was hardcore but that was like hardcore rap on steroids you know what i mean and so for us to be able to be talking about slanging on the block and, and 
and, and, and murder raps and being untouchable and running from the police and, you know what I'm saying, um, us against the government, us against the world and, you know, being above the judicial system and paying off judges and, you know, and all that stuff. That would, that is barely, that's taboo right now, but even then it was like, you know, it was like against the grain for real. I never forget one day, me and my girl was in the bed on a Saturday morning and Yo MTV Raps was on the TV. We wasn't watching it, it was just on. I'm laying there half asleep and I hear his voice. And I just sat up like the Undertaker in, on wrestling. I just sat up in the bed and was like, you kidding me? It was him. I'm like, wow, this is crazy, dude, making a really made record. You know, I was happy for him, you know. And I had got a job. You know, my wife had told me, said, uh, you know, it was New Year, after New Year, she said, she was tired of me selling dope. She said, why don't you try to get a job and do a real job? I'm like, nah, all right, I'll try. You know, so I got a job welding in Torrance. And I had a little uniform, everything. And I'm driving one day home, and I saw, I was on Compton Boulevard, and I saw a SWAT truck. And I said, dang, something going on. And it roped all off. And I was nosy, so I went in the alley around the back. I'm looking, and I see. Um, Joyce, that's Derek's mom, she was standing in the alley. And I said, Joyce, what's up? What are they doing over here? And she started laughing. She said, it's your little buddy. I said, huh? And she said, Eric. And he was standing further down the alley on a big old brick phone, the big old banana phone. He was just standing in the alley on the phone. And she said, look who here, look. I got out the car and he looked and he started laughing. And he said, come here, man. I walked down there to him. And he said, man, you got on a uniform? I was like, yeah, man. He said, you work? I was like, yeah, man. I said, man, ain't nothing though, man. I can make money, like, I can make a week's check in two hours, man. This is nothing. And he said, man, what do you do? And I told him. And that, that day, it was a Friday. He said, man, when you go back, man, quit that job, man. I said, quit? He said, man, I got you, man, quit. I said, all right. And the next day, they did, uh, the next day he called me, on Saturday. They had a show, Too Short, everybody. And we went there, and I, we did, that's the first show I did with him was there. And, uh, Ever since then, man, I've been going to the end. To the end, we, we rolling to the end. I remember being in New York, <clears throat> New Jersey, and at a press press concert came to town. And I still didn't know that Eric was Easy E. I didn't even know about N.W.A. I was in the military, you know what I mean? It was hard to get you know new music and, and the boonies and stuff in the military move from state to state. So I remember going to this concert. I was stationed in Fort Dixon, New Jersey, and I wound up going to Philadelphia to the Spectrum see the concert, which is maybe 45 minutes away from New Jersey. And I go to the concert, you know, back in the days in the military, you had to keep the military uniform on when you went to the city, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had my fatigues on, and we got to the concert, because we all went in a bunch. And, you know, we took to the bottom of my head, and I heard, you know, this this group in the other way out of Compton. I said, everybody, I'm from Compton, who could this possibly be? You know, so I'm thinking of like, you know, the LA Dream Team, who all, all those kind of like hits, they were big. But I didn't know the difference between the hip hop and the gangster rap. I didn't know the difference because we never heard of people cussing on records. So when, uh, you know, when NWA came on stage, where they was dressed, it was like I used to dress on the West Coast, you know, you know, and uh, when I start hearing, you know, EJ, we want EJ. I called my little cousin him on the phone while I was at the concert. Man, who was this? Easy E end up, yeah, he said, that's Eric. I'm like, Eric, who? He said, Eric's on the corner. I said, what you mean? He said, yeah, he's Easy E now, man, he's a multi-millionaire. I broke towards the stage. <laughs> and by me, we went over Eric, you know, he recognized me because I did walk, walk up to the stage in the military uniform. And he did acknowledge me on stage, and then he got me, uh, 
got me as close to the black stage as I could possibly get. And he asked me, you know, what was I doing, you know, in the hood. I said, I went to the army and stuff. Because we didn't see each other for a while. You know, he was doing his thing. I was, we was always homeboys. But, we, you know, you might not see a homeboy for two or three years. You know, you could be around the block with each other, you know. But I had, you know, got on him. You know, at that point when I seen my homeboy, my little homeboy on stage, rocking with people and people singing their songs that I didn't even heard of, you know, kind of astounded me and blew my mind, man. Starting up, uh, Ruthless became easy, and J.J. Fad, and after J.J. Fad knocked their album out, we brought uh, Michelle A and the D.O.C., did a few tours with the D.O.C., then we went to uh, London, came back, Above the Law was with us, cocaine, it was a, a trip that happened in a little of no time. He's just sprung so fast, and NWA just exploded. As a whole ruthless tour, it's going to be NWA, DOC, Above the Law, and Yo Mo Marquis. These were the acts on Ruthless Records at the time. Um, and Michelle A. I don't know if y'all remember that R&B stuff, but the, you know, Michelle A. She from way back in the Red and Crew days, too. She's been around with Dre since, forever since. And, uh... It was going to be a huge, huge tour. And at this time, the biggest record was the DLC, you know, one can do it better. And Doc is riding high on that. He's riding real high on that. And one night, Doc got into an accident, a car accident, went through the windshield of a Mercedes Benz, fucked up his vocal cords. So, you know, now when y'all hear him talk, he can't talk like this. That was from that accident. Subsequently, that accident, kind of threw a monkey wrench into everything because Doc couldn't go on tour. We, uh, Rufus wasn't going to go on tour without Doc. We had to see him in the hospital and pay for all that. So it really kind of threw a monkey wrench into the tour. So I didn't really get the tour. So nobody really heard of Yomar Marquis until 91 when I put out the album Art Experience. Easy and Ren were the mob, were the men that would stand up to their name. They were thugs, thugsters. You know, they had thug love. And if you threw up your signs, easy and they would get busy with you. And I let them do what they wanted until it got out of hand. Then I'd break up the fight and, and you know, take on and take care of them as they used to. The rest of the, the, rest of the guys, like your, uh, your uh, Hollywood gangster, Ice Cube. Ice Cube was never a fighter. I don't think he learned anything about fighting until he started reading his own plays. And Dre, Dre wasn't a fighter as well. Dre was, you know, Dre was a lover. Yellow, yellow, I was just a nasty guy. Yellow just believed in, <laughs> believed in screwing women and running, running in rooms. But, uh, we had a couple of times where people ran up on Easy and Bobcat ran up on us in San Diego and I didn't know who Bobcat was. And I jumped out of the Jeep and stuck a gun in his, stuck a gun in his face. And Easy had to yell up, no, no, that's, he's with us. That was one incident, and then we had a, a comedian that went on tour with us, and he didn't like the fact that my security, Andre, were kick, kicking him off the stage, and he talked about he's going to have a, Andre whooped, and at that point I asked Adrian if give me my ammo case, and when Adrian said no, no, he, I opened up my ammo case and stuck my gun in, in the comedian's face and told me, you know, no, ain't nobody gonna hurt NWA or my or my security. Then I took a couple of bullets for uh, DJ Train, which is JJ Fads DJ, and the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which was Will Smith. We were doing a show, and somebody's woman got offended by a bitch is a bitch, and they told us how they were gonna come back and get us. And they came back to the hotel in Seattle, Washington. And started shooting at a drive-by. So I jumped in front of uh, DJ Train and Will and covered them up and got the five bullets in the hand. Saved Train and, and, uh, and Will. Right now about our business. But for the for the better half of uh, our tours, we never really had that much trouble. Yeah.
man after that second NWA album, Niggas for Life, Dre left. Because it was in, inner, uh, inner company uh, beefs between Dre and Jerry, Easy's manager. And instead of taking, you know, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that Easy took Jerry's side against Dre. I really don't know what happened, tell you the truth. I just know that Dre was unhappy. Uh, he felt like Jerry was taking money. And then mind you, Cube left NWA after the first album for the same reasons, for the very same reasons. So it might've been some truth to that. And you know, of course, Jerry kept Easy paid, so he was happy. Uh, and, and Easy, Easy was really hurt by that one. Dre came out with, with, with that uh, Chronic album and all those videos dissing Eric. And you know, Eric tried to make a slight comeback and you know, talk about Dre when he was dressed, you know, in a wrecking crew looking like Prince with, 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 with lipstick and stuff. But you know what? That was the era back then, so it wasn't so much that, you know, Dre and them out there, they, they gay and, and things, things of that nature. It was just that that was kind of the look in the 80s, man. Cube wasn't there too long after I got over there, but Dre was there for a good while. You know, them guys were, were, were really tight. I mean, they were tight. I don't understand how, well, I understand how the beef started and things got how it got, but it shouldn't have. But them dudes really loved each other. I mean, when Cube left, I mean, he was upset. But when Dre left, he was really upset. I mean, you, that hurt him on a different level. You know what I mean? It wasn't like when Cube left, you know. But when Dre left, that was like a, a real friend that left. You can see the difference. Yeah. From the day one, you saw the difference. When Cube left, it was jokes in the studio. It was like that. But when Dre left, he was really, he was hurt. You know, because they were, they were really cool. Uh, I know that it hurt easy. And actually, he really didn't care about Ice Cube because he and Ice Cube weren't, weren't really that close. But Dre was his lifetime friend, and I know that it, you know, it absolutely devastated Easy. You know, when Dre left the company, it devastated him. That was his buddy. Not only was it his buddy, here's the most talented, prolific record producer of the last 22 years. I mean, you can't lose a producer like Dr. Dre and just walk away and say, oh, we're going to be as, as good as ever. I mean, Dr. Dre did the music for every single song up to that time that had ever come out on Rhythms. Once Dre left, you know what I'm saying, and they got into it, him and E, you know what I'm saying, that's when me and E, <clears throat> that's when me and E, we had stopped talking for a while because it was like, uh, I was still cool with both of them, you know what I'm saying, and, and I was cool with E, it was like, we just wasn't close no more like we used to be at that time because he wanted me to diss Dre, you know what I'm saying? And, and I was like telling him like, man, I'm not gonna diss Dre. I said, man, because I said, I wouldn't diss either one of y'all. I said, both of y'all like brothers. I said, I ain't gonna diss you with him and I'm not gonna diss him with you, you know what I'm saying? And I know he was hurt for a minute. Like, you know, I could tell he was like, cause he was on one, you know what I'm saying? But after all that bullshit boiled over, you know, and I hooked back up with him and did a uh, motherfucking reel. And we was talking about it. He was like, yeah, he was right. You know what I'm saying? He was like, you was right, man. He was right. Because he was finding out a lot of shit at that time. In his own personal life that he didn't know about. So he was like, yeah, that was, he was right. Well, you know, I mean, primarily, you know, our mind state was, was that we got to move on, you know. Um, me being at the helm of everything and, and then being, you know, kind of the, the, the understudy of Dr. Dre, I had to take the reins and, and then just basically, you know, make sure the label had focus. On another, the tone at the label was really just basically, you know, you know, we got enough, you know, we got enough momentum to keep going. You know, I, I think it, I think it kind of went bad when it became Eric's fault that, you know, why everything happened, but that's what happens when you're a leader. I just think the way it went down was really messed up because what I saw that it, it, it hurt Easy because Easy felt like, you know, he helped 
a lot of people, a lot of us, you know, in it. I think it it it, it, had, it took a toll on him because he were he was closer to all of the guys from NWA than he was the new guys, you know, the, like you know us and you know you had Shaky, you had all these different new people around us that we you know we were writing and producing for him, and he didn't have you know Ren and Cube and Dre and all these people around. So the climate for him, I think, was kind of he was kind of lonely and just you know with learning with learning us, you know what I'm saying and. And, and wanting to trust what we were trying to do, and take his career to the to that level, or even just keep momentum in his career, I, and and I just think it was because of the familiarity that he had with the rest of his group and everything, and then he got thrusted into something new. But he, the thing that the climate at the label didn't really change as much as people think, because like we went on, and you know we end up doing like black black mafia life at the time, and you know what I'm saying, and then. He, he went on and he ended up doing, um, um, I guess it was uh, its own 187, Dr. Dre. Um, and then um, we did Uncle Sam's Curse. So the label was kind of had a focus and then we signed Bone, you know, shortly after that. But in that time with the, the beef type of situation, it was kind of like, you know, everybody kind of that were together as a family kind of went every direction and aired out their dirty laundry and how they felt about, you know, the head figures or who here and, you know, everybody kind of just got, got off, you know, and was it healthy? No, it wasn't because at the end of the, at the end of the day, a lot of people said a lot of shit that didn't even know what the fuck was going on. You know what I mean? And a lot of people should have left well enough alone, you know? So, because I think at the end of it and the demise of everything, you know, as far as easy, Everybody felt like they did it for the wrong reasons. You know what I mean? Everybody broke camp for the wrong reasons, and nobody ever really worked out everything that they wanted to work out. You know, and don't get don't, don't get me wrong. I think everything runs its course. I think everybody grow out of each other. I think I just think people have to be man man enough to sit down as men and say, "Hey, this is what I want. This is what I want to do," and that wasn't done. You know, so the climate at the label, I think, with Eric was he basically got left hanging, you know, he got left hung out to dry, but we kept moving, we kept pushing. We never really, we never really wanted to like have issues with, with Dre, you know, I think that when they did Death Row, they more so wanted to have issues with us, more so to use it as a catalyst to build what they were trying to build, I think, you know, that's what I truly believe because it's kind of what happened, you know, a lot of the biting went on, you know, people left with ideas that they shouldn't have left with and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I think that was attacked you know, I think that was a tactic to kind of downplay us, you know, the people who stayed down with Easy, and versus really just throw him off of his point, you know. But Easy was a sharp enough businessman to say, "Hey, we got to keep moving, and you know, we're gonna strike back, we're gonna keep moving," you know. He understood about the label thing, you know, and plus, before that, you got to realize he had went through some back and forth stuff with with um, Cube, so. It kind of didn't really affect him as far as the business is concerned. I just think he felt like, you know, abandoned, you know, at that time. Because he felt like, you know, I've done everything I could do to keep you at, at, at play, but you still got something to say about me, you know, so. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I am a hip-hop producer, hip-hop music producer in the group Madness For Real. I've been producing ever since 1986 and um, I've been producing predominantly hip-hop, gangster rap. After a couple of years we hooked up with uh, with our current manager at the time, he was a Danish dude but he, um, he had a business where he took over US rap acts and uh, did concerts with them, people like EPMD and Queen Latifah and stuff like that. And he had um, he had a hookup to a guy called Dave Funkenklein. Dave Funkenklein was based out in L.A. and he was working on at that time a Disney-related record label called Hollywood Basic. Um, he knew about us and he actually hooked us up with uh, our very first uh, project. And Dave was so uh, Dave Funkenklein was so uh, he thought that we. Uh, we had some, we had some potential. So he hooked us up with a street promoter for Ruthless Records um, called Doug Young. Doug Young later on also worked for, 
He's a legendary street promoter in L.A. Um, he worked for uh, Death Row, amongst others, after he uh, worked with uh, Ruthless. And he knew that Dre at the time had just left Easy to go and work with with uh, Shook on on Death Row Records. Or and then he knew that Easy needed beats, so uh, he called us up and was like, "Listen, I can try and see if I can place your beats with Easy." And we sent him some beats, and um, Easy was hooked. He was interested. He wanted to work. So uh, and Easy, he was uh, he was a guy that that didn't just talk about it. He acted on it. So uh, he sent us our tickets and said, "Come to LA and work with me." So um, we packed our bags, and in 1992, uh, we stood at LAX and uh, was ready to work. And uh, first meeting Easy was, I mean, that was the first time I was really starstruck. Easy was, uh, he was a funny type, this little dude with this huge charisma. He, um, he was very cool, very down to earth, but you can still tell that he was something special. Um, he was, he was funny in many ways. I mean, I remember back in the days, he only had like white cars. And I remember in his white cars, he had debt tapes at the time. At the time, that was like crazy. I've never seen debt tapes in, in vehicles. Um, and not even ever since. 5150, this was a, um, a record we put out in, in um, December of one year. It came out, actually it came out like in January, and um, it, it, was, it was a real crazy record. That's one with Neighborhood Sniper on it. Um, and um, Only If You Want It, um, and Naughty By Nature produced on that too. You know what I mean? So that this is, all this stuff is after, after Dre left. So, you know, we still was placking. So don't get it twisted. <laughs> but Easy, he was he was ready, and he, uh, he was ready to work, and uh, he placed us over at, um, at a studio in Torrance called Audio Achievements, where he basically started his ruthless um, empire, where he, uh, before we came, had had used the studio for he blocked booked the studio for many years with this legendary um, engineer called Donham and the Dirt Biker Smith, and um, we came in and started working right away, and um, our first task with Easy was to produce, he actually came in to us and said, listen, I need a Christmas song. And we said, Christmas song? You sure? You want a Christmas song? Yeah, and uh, I want a Christmas song and I want you to incorporate at least 20 Christmas songs within the production, but you can't sample. You have to play everything. So our first task, and it was me, um, and some of my partners from Madness Real and our colleague also from Denmark called Dr. Jam. We started doing this and I mean it was we couldn't fathom that Easy had asked us to sit there and do Christmas music with gangbangers. That was for us hard to understand how that came up, that that what that idea was was good for. But we did the track and um and Easy invited everybody from Ruthless um, to come and join them on this track. I mean, we were talking about Little Rascals, we were talking about Benicia Twire, um, we were talking about uh, Adnan Clan, who later on became Black Eyed Peas, um, and a bunch of group, of, huge group of people that was uh, that was on the track. And um, the track came out fat, and I mean, that's a, it's a Christmas song that. We, we listen to every year, and I actually hear that they, they be playing the shit out of it around Christmas in L.A. So that's, uh, I guess that's our legacy as well. Yeah, well, when I was little growing up, Easy came out in like 86 with the song Boys in the Hood and Dope Man. So when that became popular, I'm from Compton. I grew up in Compton. In between Compton and Washington, these are the only two cities I ever lived in. So when I was little, we heard that song. I was probably about 10 years old maybe 11 years old, when I heard that song, you know, everybody started playing it around in the city or whatever, and shit, it became popular, and then right after that, I started trying to rap too, you know what I mean? I never knew Easy. I always knew where he lived at, where he was from, and stuff like that, but I didn't meet him up until 93. And what actually happened was, some dudes was supposed to help him start a label, 
well, was supposed to help him start Ruthless Records, actually. Some, some other cast, a dude named uh, Big Daddy Pat and a dude named Jim Bob. They from Watts, too. I grew up in the projects right here in the Jordan Downs where uh, Big Daddy Pat is from. And I guess later throughout the years, he heard me and my brother Drayster was rapping. So he came on my street one day and was like, man, I heard y'all rapping or whatever. He was like, yeah, you know, so. He was like, well, man, we're going to take y'all to the studio. So when he took us to the studio, it happened to be easy in the studio. And it's the same studio where they recorded all the NWA albums, where they recorded uh, Michelle A's album, JJ Fad, all the groups that came out in the Ruthless. And when we went in the studio, Easy put us in the booth and told us to rap. And we got in the booth, started spitting. Next thing you know, he put some beats on and we started recording music. And it just happened like that. I had a little issue with Easy, like at the time that I met him. And it was right after the little Rodney King thing happened. And uh, I seen Easy on TV with the, one of the police who beat up Rodney King, but he was the one who actually turned the other cops in, you know what I mean? And uh, Easy went down there and supported him downtown LA or whatever. So I wrote a rap actually dissing him, you know what I mean? I had a rap dissing him. So when we got to the studio, Pat and Jim Bob was like, man, this nigga got a rap dissing him. So Easy told me to say the rap. And I, I said the rap to him. And he just laughed, like, you know what I mean? But after that, he just, what he did was, he was like, uh, he said, uh, I'm gonna smoke you out. So he got a gang of weed. He wrote up like 20 joints or whatever. So he made me, he said, I'm gonna smoke, I'm gonna smoke half. You gotta smoke the other half and we're gonna see who can smoke the most. We got to like seven joints and I couldn't hang no more. So he out, he out did me and shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was always, you know, when I first got around him, I was just like starstruck a little bit because I was like, damn, this little motherfucker I've been admiring my whole life trying to, you know, actually walk in his footsteps, you know what I mean? But it was all good though. The best part about directing videos for for Easy was, uh, well, so much was great. It was going into Ruthless Records, sitting with Jerry at Easy, at Easy's office, uh, throwing ideas out. You know, Jerry's super, hardcore, uh, really pretty straightforward guy and, and a powerful man. To be sitting with that, him and, and Easy and some of the crew, I just felt so honored to be on that couch. Uh, to be in that, to be driving in there and to do so many videos for Ruthless, uh, to work with this, these great groups, to work with Above the Law and Ren, Cocaine, oh, what a great guy. And shoot all those videos in all those locations. Um, and, and to be, I was so honored to direct Real Motherfucking G's. And I'm, I'm so grateful I knew him. Uh, I'm so sorry he's, he's gone. It's, it's... After I did my first video with Easy, uh, he said, Marty, you're doing all my videos. And I didn't realize that he was serious. And the next one we did was Above the Law, BSOP, and then Call It What You Want. This 187, you know, I'm chilling at my video. It's fat, it's mega, it's all that proper, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. It's the whole pot of gumbo, the whole gallon of juice. Ruthless family in the house. Yeah, Ruthless family. Little Abraham. Come in, move forward. Yeah, you, come on. Little Abraham, what up? Who said, yeah, you. Yeah, you. Get crazy, get wild. Tell him what's up, Rick. Kiss my black ass. And when we were working with Tupac, uh, Easy, very hands-on. He's he's watching the monitor with me, and uh, he's I can tell he's really liking how Call It What You Want was. We had Tretch and Stretch there. We had Digital Underground. Uh, we had Money B, and uh, uh, Ren was there, and it was it was just a, a great experience. Just all the Ruthless Records people were there, uh, and I remember Easy leaning over to me saying. Marty, one day you're gonna be somebody. It ain't today though. <laughs> I think that was a compliment. I mean, like when I met Eric in the beginning, he he wanted me to play some more records in here, so then they brought more records. I and mean, that's how we developed that relationship. And so I played like after Boys in the Hood, then I played like Dope Man, and then I was playing like Panic Zone and, and uh, what other records I was playing in here. I played uh like when or like um uh 
uh, Easy Does It, Radio, when those came out, he, he came and brought those, you know what I mean? He was he was on top of his game, or, or he had somebody bring the records, you know what I mean? So I, I, I worked with him, and those, you know, that relationship was there through, through that time, and then later on, uh, K-Day was over, the radio station was over. Later on, he came some years later and wanted us to get back on the radio at 92.3 The Beat. And that's how he, he first came over because he wanted to sign Kid Frost. We had an album. First came over, now that I remember. He first came over because Greg Mack brought him over to our house. Greg Mack was working at his label. I guess he was helping him with some stuff. So he said, you should come over and see Tony, Tony and Julio. So he came to our studio and he was working with a group called HWA. And when he came to our studio, I had the dad of Kid Frost's album that had been shelved at Virgin Records. We had been dealing with Virgin, they weren't they weren't cooperating, we couldn't get nothing done with them. They were just holding our record up. So I played it for easy. And I remember him sitting there listening to it. And like he had no expression. Like he just sat there. in my head I was like, damn, should I even have played this for him? Because I just thought like this is Latino style rap. This ain't this even this dude's trip. Like what am I even playing? After like the third song, I felt like, damn, why did I even put this on? Because he wasn't making no expression, he was just listening to it like this. Not smiling, not fiddling with nothing, just standing there like And I was like, wow, I guess, like, you know, whatever. I let like a couple more songs play, whatever, I forgot about it. And about a, about a week later, not even a week later, maybe like three days later, he calls me and he goes, hey, let me, let, let me holler at Julio, you know what I mean? Hey, what's going on, man? He goes, how much you want for that album? I'm like, for what album? He's like, and about a, about a week later, not even a week later, maybe like three days later, he calls me and he goes, hey, let me, let, let me holler at Julio, you know what I mean? Hey, what's going on, man? He goes, how much you want for that album? I'm like, for what album? He's like, Kid Frost, I want to buy it. How much you, how much do you owe Virgin? And he's like, I was like, $100,000, you owe them $100,000 for that record. He says, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 150, go record five more songs. Just like that. And I mean, it just, like, we're like, he said, I'm gonna get my lawyers on it tomorrow and we're gonna get you out of the contract. And we get, I mean, it just moved it like this and it happened just like that. It was like, the guy made it happen and I was like, and he kind of got us out of a little bind because we, we were kind of stuck on money and we kind of needed that money. It was just, the guy came at the right time, basically, at that time. And then, in between that, he's like, hey, come meet me in my office. I wanna, I wanna talk to you about some radio stuff. I went to his office. Jumped in his car, we drove to 92.3 to the beat. I did a little bit of talking. He barely even talked. And somehow we got a radio show out of it. And that's how, you know, that became. And it was it was crazy because I wasn't trying to get back on the radio. You know? I wasn't even trying to do any of that. And it's like if it wasn't for Eric, you know, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have continued that that radio thing. You know what I mean? It was it was because of that guy that, that he pushed me into that. Let's go into here, man. You need to do this. And I told him in the beginning, I said, Eric, I can't. I don't have records like that, dog. I, I don't. I don't DJ like that. Cause I was only DJing on tour with people. I wasn't like mixing at clubs, and so you know I had to buy records. I was. I was kind of over it after 1580 K. It put a bad taste in my mouth. You know what I mean? Like the whole radio thing. So he went to some stores, and he showed up at the studio with these bags, like these, like the ones that the DJs carry, like those bags, but they were like full with records. And uh, his whole trunk was like, hey man, is this enough records right here? And I was like, oh my God, what did you do, dog? I went to buy two copies of whatever was out. So that those records, I still have those records to this day. It's like, that's how, that's, that's how the way, the, that's how the kind of guy he was, you know, he's like, if he needed to buy some, he'd get it for you. Like this, that, that, that's not the issue. Let's, if the records are the issue, let's get you the record so we can move on. And that's why I love Eric. And I always compare people to Easy E. It's like, it's like, after working with a guy like that, even though I know a lot of celebrities and a lot of people, it's like, there's only certain people that, that are, when they say they're a boss, there's, there's only a, a real small amount of people, even though they may say they are, that really know what that means and know how to carry themselves and do it that way like a boss. And that's why I understood about Eric. I, and I'm very fortunate for that reason because it helped me with how I look at people because of dealing with him. Because I realized when you really want to ball, you got to take care of your people. 
And he was really good with that. He knew how to take care of his people. If people only knew how many checks I've seen him write to people, take care of their, their bail or their warrants or pay for their phone bill or pay for this. I mean, I mean, that guy was, he was giving, man. And like, I don't think people even come out to express that enough, you know, that how much he, I seen it personally. And I'm sure his closer friends that were around him more, they they could say we're gonna say the same stories in this documentary. They're gonna sound the same because that's how Eric was. He was a giving guy. People had no clue how much of a, a giver he was. You know what I'm saying to people? He was a giving guy. You know what I mean? What's up? My name is Diamond Ice Girl, and um, I used to be signed to Ruthless Records. I was in a group called GBM, Gangsta Bitch Mentality. Um, signed to Easy e CEO Ruthless Records affiliation with Jerry Heller and um, I'm here to let you hear my part of the story and what I used to do with Ruthless and my affiliation and um, I guess I'm gonna start it from here. I was the last girl that came in GBM they had a, a, a girl group it was Silky Fine, T Ski Chan it was a girl named Storm but I guess she didn't make it to the group so the homegirls called me to come through and audition and I went in an audition, and Chad Silky was already my homegirls anyway. Shoot, and they just put me in a group. And then I, there it was, we was GBM, and um, a week after that, he gave us some Ruthless Records contracts, and I called my lawyer, Lee Young, which is Ice Cube's attorney, Mac 10's attorney, a music attorney that's in the game, and um, we signed our contracts. We were signed to Ruthless Records. And, uh, I'm Stefan, also known as Roach Killer, the original. Um, I was I was signed to Ruthless in '93, but I'm an album in '94 called Tripping with No Luggage, and a single called Frost Dead. But uh, prior to that, I was um, I was a television host, you know, dancer, choreographer, and whatnot. So I did. Um, I was in Easy's video. Um, I think easier said than done back in the day when I had my curl and whatnot. And then I started uh, hosting shows for him. He was. Um, he had these things, these talent competitions called the Ruthless, the Easy E Ruthless is Extravaganza. I'm trying to say that shit three times twice, real fast, right? Yeah, so I was doing those, I was hosting them shows, and then, uh, and then me and Rhythm D linked up, and then one day me and Rhythm D was at the house smoking, and Easy came through the door, and he was like, yo, you know this nigga, man, he got a bomb voice, and Easy was like, man, I already know that nigga, man, we will rule, and next you know it, the same day, I think he gave me my deal. So as you all know, and if you don't know, I'm Baby EZ, the second son of the Godfather of Gangsta Rap. You know what I'm saying? I'm basically here to tell you a little bit about my life with my father, you know? My father was you know, the greatest father I can only say because as my father, I can't really speak for nobody else, but you know what I'm saying? As a kid growing up, you know, I was around a lot. You know, I was including in a lot of scenarios my pops was in as far as music videos, you know, going out as as a family, you know, with my whole family. You know, my pops, he used to line up little events as far as having us all out Disneyland events. You know what I'm saying? He was always there, and whether or not he was busy somehow, he made a way to at least provide for the family, keep everybody satisfied, and, you know, it just, it was a, it was a, a long but short trip for me and, and the rest of the family, but, you know, I used to be at the studio, you know, he used to drag me along with him at the studio. I used to be with him, Jerry Heller, going out to eat Cheesecake Factory. You know, a lot of little shit as a, as a child. I seen a lot, you know, experienced a lot. Just being around my pops in general, seeing how he handled everything on a business note, you know what I'm saying, and to, from the streets, and how many people actually fucked with him in general, you know, because he was a real dude, so, you know. Just a lot of shit, you know, it's probably like too much to really sit there and tell. I'd be on the whole motherfucking documentary if that's the case, as much memories as I got, you know, but all I know is I know how everybody feel, you know, but from a family standpoint, you know, I you know, I miss him. I love him, you feel me? I wish he was still here. It's a lot of people who, who really don't know what happened, including myself. I don't know the situation, but all I know is I'm just gonna contribute to keeping the legacy going, including my brothers, my sister. You know, whoever else want to feel they want to add to the pot. Really dope. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Kanima Ivor. I used to host this show back in L.A. in the 90s, and it was called New Generation. And that's where I hooked up with my boy, Easy E. -E. 
I remember that the show that we had, the hip hop entertainment show that I was hosting, that my mom was producing back in the 90s, we had already um, interviewed a lot of people and worked with a lot of record companies. And she had submitted proposals to them for different ideas that she had. And we heard a lot of no's. We heard a lot of no's and went knocking on a lot of doors that did not open up for us. And we went to Ruthless Records. And when we went knocking at Ruthless, knocking on the door, guess what? He said, come on in. Because he was a visionary. So when we submitted things to him that we believed in, he looked at it and he believed in it too. Since then, it was on and cracking with new generations and eat. Welcome back to New Generations. We still have at the Mother's Ten Family Fund. And, and it's I'm going here, down. And it's going down. I'm lost to your FC smoke blower. You know I'm fucking with legends. Easy, what a weapon. Sir, yeah, I'm your nigga lost to man. Uh, shit. I've been doing this shit since 95, man, 96, since I was going to Crenshaw, uh, Crenshaw High School. Uh, shit, uh, I met E through uh, my cousin, actually, uh, my homeboy's cousin, Cash East, my right hand. Uh, his cousin, Loco SAB. Uh, I met E through local SAB. He used to stay on uh, right behind the Barbary Coast and shit. And that's the first time I met E. You know, he had came with rhythm and shit and said, I was like, man, that's easy E and rhythm D. And I was just like, fuck, like, what it do, E? You know, shit. You know, like to be in the presence of a legend like that was amazing, you know. So, of course, a young nigga was like straight struck, you know. Uh, it was wild, man, and from that day on, you know, uh, it's been ruthless all the way, man. I was in the back, uh, supposed to be next up and shit, you know, me and Cash Sheets was doing our thing. Uh, and we've been here uh, since then, man, you know, pushing this ruthless legacy. From uh, day to day, I lived, I lived with Easy more than I did my own family. And I watched Easy grow from a, a, uh, not even a thug, he was just a, a little little cool brother with an entourage of homies everywhere. And uh, watched them start making records and performing and you know, doing gigs everywhere. And every time we, we went anywhere, we had this uh, following of people. People just loved Easy. He was really good with kids, he loved kids. It wasn't disrespectful like the rappers of today. Even though it, we had a bitch as a bitch, but off the record, when we weren't on stage, he loved women more than anything. He was more respectful to women. But uh, he did things to sell himself on, on tour and on shows. Off the record, he would be a, a gentleman. He loved women and respected women. On the outer surface, you could never tell if Eric had any problems or not, you know, but Eric was so deep within the business that it was more to it than just a breakup. There was a lot of internal things happening to Eric, you know, as an individual, the CEO of a company. Um, you know, monies, groups, um, contracts, um, he had bone, but by him being losing a friend and business associates. Not only did he lose a friend but business associates, he lost, you know, part of the company. You know, um, looking at Dre as, you know, the producer, you know, maybe his finances wasn't as big, but in the business sense he was the producer of a lot of that music. And uh, you had Shug, you know, working for Eric as a bodyguard for the DOC, so, you know, and then you had the DOC, who was one of the major writers over there, platinum artists. You can imagine when you lose two of your main people in your company, and it wasn't like he lost them to someone he didn't know. It was that that drained him kind of like business up and learned more about the business and had, you know, to have town some things. I got the call late for the next, I think it was the next day, because I didn't, 
I didn't get it that night. But we had a rule with him. He wasn't supposed to be out like that anyway. But that was he. He was going to go where he wanted to go. And uh, he told me they was tripping and they threatened him. And, uh, and I couldn't believe that, you know, but it wasn't Dre, you know. So I couldn't believe, you know, like, no, nah, not Dre. Like, no, nah, Suge and his people and all of that. And, and I couldn't really believe that from Suge either because he was, he, he was one of us. He was a DOC bodyguard. He was there. He was there with us. And uh, I just, you know, it's the, it was money. You know, sure he got a taste of making some good money. And, you know, I can't knock sure because, you know, I probably would have done something like that myself. He did, he did what he had to do to come up. But it just, you know, it, it, was, it was wild. It was a whole different period, you know. Like I told E, I said, dude, this is this is real stuff. You know, a lot of stuff back then, a lot of, you know, these these rappers would create stuff to happen, interesting things, almost like a reality show. But this was real. Like, dude, this is some street. Somebody, somebody can die behind this. It's getting, it was getting to that point. Somebody's gonna get hurt behind this. And um, he just said, well, y'all chill out, man do this because we met him and Dre talked at the Palladium we were all there I think it was a Michelle A concert we all went uh, me, we, the twins we were there and Shug was trying to get close and that was a perfect night to, to handle that and he didn't you know he just, just didn't want to do it that way because, you know, we told him, him and Dre was talking in a corner in the Palladium. And uh, Suge was standing off and we had one dude with him. And we were saying, dude, it's time. Let's, let's get dude right now. And he kept saying, no, no, he didn't want to do it like that. He didn't want to do it like that. But you know what's so funny? We never saw Suge not with 20, 30 people again, ever. You know, I said, that, that, well, that's over. <laughs> yeah. You don't get him like that no more. Yeah. But he had his own plan, how to work everything out. And that, from what happened, I mean, after the chronic came out and he got that override, so it worked out financially for E, that's for sure. Yeah. It wasn't worth all the other crap that could have went down. Yeah. First, we thought that we didn't feel that Dre was going to leave. And we negotiated with him in good faith for a long time. And uh, his people kept telling us that he was going to continue to produce NWA and, and Easy. And we went back and forth, you know, with contractually over that for a long time. But after that, you know, it was a war zone after that. So. You know, we fortified the offices, we had uh, security, and uh, things changed. The fun went out of rap music, and I attribute that to Mr. Charm, shouldn't I? Man, when I, when I found out that shit happened, I was like, damn, you know, I didn't believe it. You know, and then he was like, yeah. And he was, and he was just like, serious. It's like he was really in like, this whole, Mood, everything changed. Yeah, song. Snoop and Dre came with the song Dre Day. They came with the song Dre Day. So I guess Easy had a uh, had a little comeback that he wanted to do. And his album was actually already done. That EP, uh, it's on Dr. Dre 187 Killer. That album was already actually recorded and, and actually finished. But we started recording a new song called Real Compton City G's, a real motherfucking G's. And uh, when when we recorded that song, he put that that song that it's on on that album that was supposed to be the single. So he he quickly erased that and made Real Compton City Jesus single because everybody was telling him that was the song to come back on Dre with. So yeah, that's how that happened. Yeah, that was it. Do you remember any specifics as far as what he told you? 
Uh, he talk, I can't remember every little word, but it was like on the point to fuck everybody. I'm rolling with my shit. First motherfucker tries something, I'm gonna kill his ass. <laughs> can you imagine breaking up the Beatles because, I mean, this was the Black Beatles. Breaking them up just because you wanted part of the action. You know, I would have done anything for an NWA reunion record. I would have walked away from it. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, between um, Brian Turner and Pat Charbonnet with Cube and, and uh, Shug with Dre, I mean, the greatest group of the second half of the 20th century, you know, broke up, which I think is, is inexcusable. Was a time where uh it was a time where uh I guess Shook Knight was upset because when I would go when I would play on the Ruthless Radio Show, I would play, Easy would tell me to play Death Row music. That it, well first of all, he didn't tell me to play it. He he asked me. I asked him one day, like, hey man, I'm gonna play this record because I don't like people to tell me what to play, first of all. So it wasn't even a thing of he he was gonna be able to tell me yes or no. I was still gonna play it because I like the music, you know what I mean? So, but what I wasn't gonna play was Dre Day. And so, he said, yeah, man, I don't care about that shit. I get paid for that shit, homie. Play that shit. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So, we, I would play Death Row stuff in between, you know? So I guess Suge Knight, during the week, he came up to the beat and he was upset. Like, they were scared of him too. So he came in and told them, man, tell Easy don't be playing none of my music. And they got all scared, man. They called us up and they were like, we gotta have a meeting and security needs to be beefed up. It was a real trippy thing for us. And they were like, <laughs> I remember Easy, they told Easy, Eric did the shoot night came and he said that <clears throat> he said that he don't want you playing none of his music anymore. And we don't want no problems with him. He's like, man, fuck Shug Knight. I don't give a fuck. Julio, this Saturday, play all that nigga shit. That's exactly what he said. And everybody in the beat was like, like. Like, oh, like everybody was so scared, bro. And he's like, oh man, fuck him. Who we gonna play that shit off, man? The whole shit this weekend. And so I went home and I had to change the whole idea of the show, what I was gonna do. Cause he wanted me to play all death row. So it was, it was a trip. So I remember that night, it was myself, Tony, Eric. I think it was Yella, Big Man, and maybe one of the twins. I'm not sure if it was even both of them. It was like one of them, right? So when we're walking out of the beat, this is after the show's over, right? This is that Saturday, right? As we walk out, there was a gate over here, right? So as soon as you walk out, our cars are all parked over here. As soon as I walk out, like, I look this way because I'm thinking, oh, man, there's going to be some fools at the gate. Like, I'm, like, I'm thinking Death Row's showing up. These niggas is going to, they're coming. I just, in my head, I'm thinking they're coming, man. I, I look at it. Easy, easy test me from the back. Man, why you scared, man? Why you scared? I'm like, no, nah, man. I just, he was laughing because it was so funny because he was like, really? I don't know, man. Eric just wasn't scared of the guy. He just, he didn't give a fuck. And it was like funny because I, I remember being all panicked, like, oh man, I brought a baseball bat and I was like, man, just in case these fools show up, I don't know what's gonna happen. And I mean, I'm rolling with Eric, I, I wasn't in there beat. I knew Shug Knight, you know what I'm saying? No, I didn't have no beef with the guy, you know what I mean? So, but that was a funny story, I never forget that one from Eric because he, he caught me all scared and you see, like, why, why are you scared, Julio? They ain't gonna come up here and do nothing, man. And it was just funny because we all started laughing. It was so funny, dude. I never forget that one, man. Eric was funny, man. I used to have a good time with that guy. He was so funny that dude, man. No, we would catch stuff on the street. I mean, just a little sporadical stuff. You might run into a couple of dog pound people somewhere, and there'd be some words exchanged, some FUs, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, caught Snoop at a uh, Mickey Howard concert one night, and you know, we was wanting to mad dog him and bother him. It was so funny. I'm looking, I'm telling twin, and they're like, man, this fool Snoop up here. You know what I'm saying? And they, uh, he was sitting at the table with him, talking. You know what I mean? I guess, man, he had his, you know what I mean? He had his own way of doing stuff. You know? 
Violence wasn't the easy way. The easy way was everybody make money. <laughs> we could do this and make money. <laughs> Violence, we ain't gonna make no money. Like, okay. Like the first time we actually, after the songs came out or whatever, and all the little controversy was going on, you had the Vox channel where the video was being played every day. And I was still living in Watts, like the area I'm in right now. And uh, we actually got nominated for a Grammy for that song. So we was at the Universal Amphitheater, the Universal City Walk or whatever. And uh, this is the first time that Ruthless and Death Row actually met up. And you know, after the song was out, and so it was a lot of, it was a lot of tension in the air. And uh, we walked into the thing and Suge and all them was in there, Dre, all the dog pound, they dog dash, corrupt, snoop, and uh he even had the DLC with him. And then he had all his homeboys, all his blood homeboys, it was in there like 300 deep. It was only me, Easy, my brother Dre, the two bodyguards and one of the homeboys. Actually Jim Bob, the dude who brought us to Easy and uh, you know, we started, we, we was in there, we got into it, you know what I'm saying? Like, we had words, and uh, Michael Conception, from we all in the same gang, we put that project together. He seen us over there, like, getting into it, so he kind of stepped in. I was telling Suge, like, you know, it ain't gonna go down like that. Suge was basically telling, because Suge actually came up to Easy and put his arm around him, and then they walked off, and Suge was, like, basically trying to threaten him a little bit. So me and my brother walked over there, and Michael Conception seen us talking. Snoop mobbed up, and so Michael Conception was like, man, this ain't the time and place for that. So uh, actually, when we went outside, we thought they was gonna try something. So we sent one of our homeboys back to back over here to watch, and he brought like seven guns. You know what I'm saying? Brought the guns back, we all got a pistol. We stepped outside, and we, we pushed up on Suge, and I'm like, what y'all wanna do? We thought y'all wanted to do something, you know what I'm saying? So. They kind of bowed it down, so we went our own way, they went their own way. At the time when 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 we came over, the, the beef with Dre had really begun. And I remember Easy sitting with a copy of, uh, of the Chronic album, and clowning Dre, clowning Dre for that he looked as if he was on a grandma frame. He had a grandma frame that was framing his picture on the, on the cover. I remember him making fun of that and saying, he looked like an old grandma, he looked like an old woman. And Easy was, of course, he was happy and unhappy at the same time, I could feel that, you know, because Dre, Dre was his homeboy, but he had to trade him. So therefore, he used this, as Easy always would, as a business opportunity. And um, to catapult himself, and I mean, every time Easy did anything at the time, he would sell at least a mill. So, I mean, a lot of people would hear about this. I've been an EZ fan ever since NWA days. I grew up on um, NWA. I was a real big fan of NWA. When they broke up, I still stuck with them. I didn't give up on them. I want all the albums all over. He was, he was my favorite out the group. R.I.P. I miss you. Hello, this is Ruthless. Hello, this is Ruthless. Hello, this is Ruthless. Hello, this is Ruthless. What's up everybody? My name is Tuki G from EasyEasyPT.com Forum I am here to meet you today, I am here to meet you all my Balkans What do you have, brother? And all I want to say is much love to Easy E, the godfather of gangster rap and his family and children And much respect to this documentary and its creator who made a big job to honor the legacy of a real legend yeah, homeboys, this was for me, and remember, we Balkans know who's the G. Yeah. I'm Emily Cox. I'm the only one brother who keeping his rootless in Macedonia. He's a motherfucking me. How can I describe this game? I mean, he was a real genius. Motherfucking godfather of gangster rap. Such a great spirit. You miss you, LPZ, right? Real G stay ruthless. The black mafia for life. He was a legend. Hip hop fucks it to death. Never saw. No way, no how. Now I'll let it be known that we're giving up the real right here in Portland, Oregon.
He is someone who is a very under-recognized icon in the industry. He should be looked at as a hero. He is someone who came up during a time where it was very difficult for minorities to come up and prosper. He got out of dealing, found legitimate success, and he shared that outlet with others, regardless of their background, gender, genre, or age. He is a hero. Hello, I'm from Latvia, and we love easy. What up, y'all? This is Mike253 from the Easy E Forum. Straight out of Tacoma, Washington. God bless the memory of Easy E. Rest in peace. 11523. Peace to Easy E's family. And peace to all the Easy E fans out there, especially on the Easy E Forum from EasyECPT.com. You know what I'm saying? Easy E is my favorite rapper. And he has been for 17 years since I was 12 years old. You know what I'm saying? I'm still bumping Easy E every day. Ruthless for life. You know what I'm saying? Much respect to EasyECPT.com. God bless the memory of Easy E. Rest in peace. 11523. Much respect to the makers of this documentary, too. Easy E, Ruthless for Life. The hip hop thugster. And for all the Easy E fans out there, cheers. Sipping on a 40. Peace. Welcome to the Ruthless Memories. This is for the late, great, easy motherfucking E. Let's do this motherfucking thing. Easy E T P T dot com. Easy mother. It's no motherfucking end. Easy mother. It's the motherfucking reaper man. It's the West Coast forever. Let's pay homage to this motherfucking name. Easy E. The Godfather of Kicks Rap.